Okay, let's talk about chapter 10, our other significant biochemical pathway here, photosynthesis. And so here is that process that we associate typically with plants. And indeed, plants do this, but there are other types of organisms that do this. Um, multicellular and unicellular algae, these guys otherwise known as the kelps, that officially aren't plants, but still they photosynthesize. And then we have some a couple different kinds of bacteria that also carry out photosynthesis. So in aquatic systems, a lot of algae are carried out, or a lot of photosynthesis is carried out by algae and bacteria. In terrestrial systems, it's primarily plants, although there also are some aquatic plants. We have, scientists have begun to attempt to harness photosynthesis to create ways to provide energy for society. Um, for example, you can get algae to generate um, what we would call biofuels, which uh, a primary type is what's called biodiesel. You can get these algae to generate fuels that can be used to um, power vehicles and such. It's still somewhat experimental, not done on a very large scale. We're also trying to figure out how to create solar cells that basically use the process of photosynthesis to generate electricity. Um, someday these things might be used on a wide, wide basis. But for now they're kind of experimental. <coughs> All right, so let's just talk about photosynthesis. Here we are. Of course, we're in the plant here, uh, and it's leaf, the, the plant organ that, for the most part, is responsible for carrying out photosynthesis. Um, Inside the leaf, you have what are called the mesophyll cells. Those are the photosynthetic cells. They're loaded with chloroplasts. Um, of course, have the vascular tissue, which is going to bring the water in. It's necessary, and it's going to take the sugar solution away that has been made. And you also need to get some CO2 in, so the CO2 in the water. And then you've got the oxygen that's produced which uh, the excess oxygen is released from the leaves. Um, the stomata are the openings on the leaves that allow for this gas exchange. Now, in addition to getting CO2 in and oxygen out, plants also lose water through their leaves. Of course, a lot of the water is used in the photosynthetic process, but because it's much more wet or humid inside the leaf than outside the leaf. You just sim you have simple diffusion of water out of the stomata. We'll uh, talk at the end of the chapter about how the stomata are used to regulate that water use and how some plants deal with that. So here we are with one of those mesophyll cells, again loaded with all those chloroplasts. Here's our individual chloroplasts where all the photosynthetic action is. Um, that inner thylakoid membrane where you have the light reactions going on, the liquid surrounding the thylakoid inside here, which is where you have the um, um, uh, the Calvin cycle going on. So here's our reaction again like in cellular respiration, we have a redox reaction going on. But here, so we have carbon dioxide and water reacting under the presence of energy in the form of light. And so what's happening is the CO2 is being reduced, it's gaining electrons, and as it does that, it gets built up into this more complex molecule, glucose. And the water is being oxidized electrons are being stripped off of it and in the process it breaks down and really re release some oxygen. Alright, so that's our redox reaction going on here and here's sort of our big picture. You want to keep this image in mind as you think about photosynthesis. You've got again the thylakoid where you have the light reactions going on obviously making use of the light Here's where we also incorporate the water. Um, 
what we're going to be doing is splitting the water to provide electrons that can be energized and transferred to NADPH. In the process, we're going to phosphorylate ADP to make some ATP. And these two molecules are going to provide energy for the Calvin cycle. Now, as we split the water to provide those electrons, we release the oxygen. Over the Calvin cycle, we use the energy of these two molecules to convert CO2. We're going to fix CO2. We're going to grab onto it and grab a bunch of them and spit out some sugars. <clears throat> and then, of course, in the process, these guys have given up energy, so they have to go back over to the light reactions to be re-energized. Okay, so now, light. So here's the electromagnetic spectrum you've probably seen before, all these different wavelengths from really short wavelengths to really long wavelengths. And the part of the mag uh, spectrum we're concerned with is the visible light, this relatively narrow band sort of in the middle with the different uh, wavelengths, the different colors of light from the shorter wavelengths, the violet and blue and the green, to the longer wavelengths, the reds and orange and yellows. <coughs> and so those, that's what we're interested in. That's what allows us to see. That's what gives everything around us the different colors they have, this visible spectrum, what we can see. We can't see any of these others, although we can, of course, feel infrared. That's basically heat. And UV, we know, is coming from the sun. Most of the, atmos the atmosphere, for the most part, filters that out. And there are some organisms, like bees, that apparently can see UV light, but, but we can't. And so plants, as we know, are, for the most part, green. And they're green because they're not really using the green wavelengths, as we'll see. They are reflecting those wavelengths, or those wavelengths just go straight through them. Thus, the leaves and other parts of plants appear green, because they're mostly reflecting that light. Now, what do they absorb, and how can we figure out what they absorb? Well, um, you can use a spectrophotometer, which is a device, as we saw in lab, that shoots light through a solution. You can see how much light is transmitted through the solution. So for example, if you have a chlorophyll solution and you shoot green light through it, vast majority of that light gets through because it's not being absorbed, and you have a very high transmitting, almost 100%. Whereas if we were to shoot, say, blue light through, we can see a lot of the blue light is absorbed. It's not transmitted, thus we have a low transmittance. It would be the same if we shot red light through there. We'd have a low transmittance. So that can be used to generate an absorption spectrum. So here we have different types of photosynthetic pigments, chlorophyll A and B and carotenoids. Chlorophyll A is our primary photosynthetic. Chlorophyll B and carotenoids are what are known as accessory pigments. They're going to, as we'll see, help chlorophyll A out. And so we see, just as we saw up here, blue light's mostly absorbed by chlorophyll. You get high peaks of absorption with chlorophyll down in the blue wavelengths and also down in the red wavelengths, but not in the green. The green, for the most part, is just being reflected and going straight through. Carotenoids, you can see there, most of their, or their absorption is exclusively down here at the violet and blue end of the spectrum. So that's our absorption spectrum. And it's related to the action spectrum, which is the are the wavelengths of light that most stimulate photosynthesis. And not surprisingly, it's going to be the blues and the reds where you get most of the photosynthesis occurring. And here, as measured by <coughs> the amount of O2 produced. Here's our chlorophyll molecule, this organic molecule, consisting of a bunch of hard carbons and hydrogens and some oxygen. And this long hydrocarbon tail that helps hold it in the thylakoid membrane. The slight difference here, this is chlorophyll A we're looking at, but you just change this methyl group here to a CHO and you'll get a chlorophyll B. The action for the most part occurs in this what's called this porphyrin ring, where you have the central magnesium of all things. And what happens is, you notice these dotted lines here, 
unlike these nice solid lines, these, these covalent bonds, this is not a solid covalent bond. It's a bond that shifts a lot. And in particular, when sunlight shifts, that central part gets really excited. And as we'll see, electrons are lost from this reaction center here. And so that's where the magnesium is, is where the electrons are going to be spit out and where it's really um, uh, reacting to that sunlight, you might say. All right, chlorophyll. And so the chlorophyll molecules are clustered into what are called photosystems. And these chlorophyll molecules and these other accessory pigments as well absorb this sunlight energy. The energy is transferred along sort of in what's described as these molecules resonate. They sort of vibrate as the sunlight hits them. And that vibrational energy is passed along. And it's sort of funneled into the reaction center here where you have some chlorophyll A molecules that get so excited they basically release electrons. They release electrons. And those energized electrons are going to be grabbed on by what's called the primary electron acceptor and we'll see what happens to them. They are then passed along an electron transport chain where we're going to make some ATP to another photosystem where they're re-energized, passed along and then we're going to convert NADP into NADPH. We're going to reduce it. We're going to add electrons, and also it's going to grab onto a hydrogen ion. And notice the name of this particular enzyme here, NADP reductase. It's an enzyme that facilitates the reduction of NADP into NADPH. All right, here's water providing our electrons that are, because again, the chlorophylls are losing electrons, so you have to supply new ones. As we split the water, we're generating some oxygen. This splitting of water using sunlight is known as photolysis, or photolysis, the splitting of water using sunlight. Also notice that the photosystems, there's a couple of them, there's photosystem 2 and photosystem 1, and the order seems a little strange, um, that 2 comes first and 1 comes second, but that is sort of a historical artifact of that photosystem 1 was discovered first, uh, and, they, and then they discovered a second photosystem, and they said, oh, here's photosystem 1 and photosystem 2, but they didn't necessarily know the relationship between these, and it wasn't until a little later that they discovered that in the process things kind of get started with photosystem 2 and then move on to photosystem 1, but the original designations were kept. <clears throat> so 2 comes first and then 1 comes second. Now, basically an equivalent amount of ATP and NADPH are generated as electrons flow through this in a one-way direction. Okay. We'll see when we look at the Calvin cycle that we're going to need some extra ATPs relative to NADPHs. So how are we going to generate those extra ATPs? Well, of all the electrons that flow through here, some of them, about every other one to be exact, is going to come back to this electron transport chain here, where these, these molecules here, a lot of them are what are called cytochromes. And we're going to generate some extra ATPs. Okay. In fact, we're going to generate about 50% more ATPs than NADPHs. All right. This is what's known as cyclic electron flow as opposed to this sort of non cyclic or one way flow. And again, some just flow one way, but then about every other one is sort of spit back into the electron transport chain to generate an extra ATP. All right, how do we generate those ATP? Well, it's the same as what happens in cellular respiration. We use chemiosmosis with ATP synthase. We'll see we're going to basically pump hydrogen ions across a membrane and allow them to flow back through ATP synthase to diffuse back through and generate some ATPs. We'll see um, when we look at the details of the light reactions again how, how that happens. Okay. Thanks.